Okay, so we are coming to the end of our conference. It uh, is a long time developing a conference, organizing it, dragging abstracts out of people, dragging papers out of those whose abstracts have been accepted, dragging you all here into Estonia through, through flight delays, strikes, weather, um, and just the fact that we're a long way from anywhere, um, except Helsinki maybe. Um, and yes, all that preparation work, and now we're here and suddenly, bang, it's like, oh, we're already at the end of it. And all that work, and suddenly we're we are there at the end of it. So a conference is a great thing. We get all this networking. We have a chance to meet each other. We have a chance to hear presentations. But a conference should be more than that. We've had discussions. We've had uh, all sorts of interesting things. But how do we capture that? And when we talk about a conference proceedings, it really is about something that proceeds out of the conference. Um, and so many actually just finish, you have the papers and everybody says, great networking, fantastic food or whatever, goes away, oh, it was really great, and now I'm going to the next conference. Um, and so it goes on. So it's, it's really a good thing to, to be able to pull together and summarize some of what has emerged from the conference. Because although there's a lot of really interesting stuff in the papers, they themselves often are a catalyst for stimulating discussion and debate. So um, what I'm going to do is not a keynote speech, actually, even though it was billed as that. What I'm going to do is to try to summarize very generally at this point some of the things that emerged during the discussions and which were noted down by the chairs of those parallel sessions. I don't know if you knew, those of you who were chairs had to do it, obviously, but those of you who weren't maybe didn't realize that they were trying to capture the essence of what had gone on in each of the sessions. So thank you very much, chairs, um, and for the, for the notes that you made and for making sure that they are more or less decipherable in your handwriting. Um, so you should be very glad that I didn't have to fill one in. Um, so I've looked over these notes and I've tried to make an overview of some of the main things that came out, especially those that perhaps emerged several times or proved to be quite common themes running through it. And some of them also were ones that I was in, uh, involved with and picked up myself, and the rest of them came out of what you had been talking about. Now, this isn't the only summary, because what I'm going to do is make some notes based on these, uh, the, your notes and write it up into a section that will go into the proceedings. So all the, the further details that you recorded that I can't possibly uh, give out right now will be captured in that way. So we actually do have um, a bit of uh, a proceedings. And the other aspect is, is that while it's the Modscapes project and there's been lots of discussions amongst the Modscapes team or the Modscapers as, uh, as we are known, we also have about half, uh, m more than half of the papers are by non-modscapers. And they're all very interesting, and some of them expand the coverage of the discussion of modernist landscapes and modernism beyond the study countries into rather other countries of the European Union and a bit beyond into Turkey and China and so on. And all of that is very interesting too. So it's a good way of bringing in some of the thoughts and ideas and uh, examples and experiences which have come in from outside of the Modscapes project. So as I say, what I'm going to present here is very much a summary, but there will be a longer paper uh, included in the proceedings. So the themes that I've drawn out from these uh, papers are essentially this. Um, an aspect about research methods, Issues to do with heritage, precedents and competing paradigms, which come out of research, uh, research uh, disciplinary uh, views and so on. Something that hasn't really emerged very much at all is gender issues. The certain discussion that came out in several times about uh, the kind of the, the contrast or the integration or lack of, of the vernacular and the modern in architecture and so on. Issues to do with land appropriation, which emerged at some sessions as well, uh, which, again, maybe haven't been uh, very highly discussed. 
sustainability of the various schemes that were presented, uh, uh, collectivization and uh, internal colonization and so on. This idea of the urban in the rural, uh, which has come out in some other projects beyond those in discussion in Modscapes. Some aspects about uh, where are ideologies uh, and, and, and how are they, they looking and the way in which there are often um, very big similarities between what one ideology produced and what a, a competing ideology produced in actual fact. And then um, bringing, mo the, bringing modernity forward out of, let's say, modern with a capital M into the contemporary of what people talk about modern things, but not modern, if you see what I mean. And so there were some interesting aspects of more contemporary uh, modernity that uh, emerged. And then there were some discussions, I think, too, about uh, the propaganda side of things, which we had in some, in some quite nice sessions, and those posters out on the, on, the, on the easels, which I hope you've been looking at, and how to read that propaganda, and what does it tell us about the ways in which they were done. So I'm going to go through these things, raising a few questions, making a few points, but what I'd like to do then is to open it up and to see what your reaction is to these things, which I'm bringing out from what we've all talked about, but also your perspectives on that and to bring it together. And, if, and uh, as this is going to be recorded, then we'll, we'll also have that discussion recorded. And I think that'll be very interesting. So here we go. So research methods. So pretty much all of us at the conference, apart from maybe some students and uh, one or two, are essentially doing research and presenting research findings. So we are researchers at, at, at one stage or another. So there's a lot that comes out in our projects, uh, applying and uh, adapting and developing methods and tools from a range of different paradigms and uh, research uh, disciplines, like uh, GIS or social science works or, uh, or um, uh, text analysis or uh, whatever. So there's quite a bit about that and the way in which the methods that we're applying are themselves being developed and applied in, in different ways for, for answering the questions and within the context of what we're looking at. There was some, uh, some stuff raised about how we can link a lot of the case study kind of work, which many people are presenting, not just the modscapers, but the non-modscapers, very much specific case studies. And it's always an issue with, with case study research, how you make that relate to the bigger picture. How you can bring generalization, well, maybe not generalization, but certainly you can bring a bigger picture from the basis of lots of localized examples. So there's an interesting challenge for uh, pulling it together um, and how we uh, deal with those results. Um, some points about capturing the spatial temporal um, aspects and characteristics of some of these projects. And we've seen some. So, some nice presentations of maps showing things over time, and then we had a, a really interesting kind of time-lapse video made from Google Earth images um, of uh, mining brown coal in eastern Germany that uh, would look really, really interesting, showing that temporal change of the space. So there are various ways of presenting that and analysing it, but how do we capture that maybe in, uh, in non-motion... Um, uh, techniques, for example, and then how we use different representation techniques as, as a coherent research strategy. So we have representation by graphics, we have representation by video and film, we have representation by three-dimensional computer models. Uh, there are various ways in which we can present and represent the changes and the and the evidence that we've presented that we've collected in our work, and how we make some of that perhaps legitimate. As, uh, as research tools, which can be publishable and, uh, and so on, and how we actually make the most and the best of some of those different techniques. And then, just a very practical issue, which is how we handle the quantity, the diversity, and the very nature of the materials that we are collecting in whatever research that we are doing. And some of it's field research, and some of it's... Uh, it's um, it's uh, documentary work and uh, films, and it's um, uh, interviews with people, and it's uh, mapping work, and it's literature analysis, and all of these very, very different materials have somehow to be 
to be brought together and related to each other. And it needs a lot of practical handling at one level, but it needs a lot of thinking about how to make it work when you're writing papers and writing books and, and so on. And then uh, a research methodological question of how you would actually, uh, as an interesting output of research, looking at the performance of rural settlements. You know, how did they perform in, in economic terms or social terms and so on, um, as a way of evaluating their success or failure and, uh, and how that was over time, maybe. So there's um, a, a small number of items to do with research and research methods. So then we have the issue of heritage, because we're dealing with modernist um, projects, and we're dealing with things even like nuclear power stations in Britain, or large coal-fired power stations that are now closed and mothballed and uh, under um, um, uh, decommissioning. And are they going to be dealt with as heritage? When does heritage start? You know, um, is something that's two years old already heritage? Is something that we've done this this week or just five minutes ago already history and already heritage? You know. Um, so, how and by whom is the heritage value of the legacies of modernist rural landscapes decided? Is it bottom up, as we've we've heard with Gerhardt's uh, presentation about the way that people want to decide what is their heritage and even invent their heritage and cut out certain things from the from the discourse and so on? Is it top down from the heritage organisations? And so, the military heritage of Estonia, there's. Um, several thousand military objects lying and scattered about the landscape, but only 29, I think was the number that Anne Lena said to me, 29 of them can be actually put on the register. So how do you select them? Why do you select them? Who selects them? And so on. And so what does it mean and how is it assessed for different groups of people? And the heritage, okay, there's architectural heritage, there's cultural heritage, but also there's a lot of ecological heritage. Um, and values, and we shouldn't necessarily miss some of those out. You know, we've seen how the landscape was was drained in the Pontine Marshes, and now it's covered in uh, herbicides to make kiwi fruits grow. Or we've seen the drainage of the wetlands, and wetlands are our important resource in Northern Europe. Um, how do we maybe restore some of them? Is that appropriate to do that? Because the ecological value is higher than the um, cultural heritage value, or is it? And how do we look, talk about that? So there are different uh, uh, paradigms of of heritage, um, which we have to talk about, and it's uh, and it needs to be understood. Then we have um, all these different paradigms, which we're dealing with in the projects, and different people are from different departments and look at things in different ways, and we often speak different languages, and uh, we don't uh, understand the same terms. Um, all of these things are really quite uh, quite challenging for multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary research and so on. And I think when we've seen lots of projects presented, we've seen a mapping project, we've seen an interviewing project, we've seen um, a documentation of architecture project, we've seen a way of, of, of looking at uh, power stations, we've seen a way of looking at roads, we've seen ways of looking at military stuff, we've seen ways of looking at um, uh, all sorts of different uh, relationships and, and so on. Uh, and it's a big challenge as to how to uh, bring all that together. Through what lenses are we looking and how does this affect the academic discourse and how we communicate the results of research uh, in that way. Um, so we've seen all these individual things, and now we see how it all has to be related together. And have we actually captured or examined all the paradigms that might be relevant? Are there ways of looking at the field which actually is not represented in the, in the broad group of researchers who are in this room or have been in this room throughout this conference, and so on? Uh, are we looking at these things ecologically? Hmm, not really. Um, are we looking at them economically? Well, not really. Um, have we any lawyers to look at the legal frameworks and things like that? Hmm, probably not. So we can't maybe look at everything, but there are aspects which we probably need to look at, and uh, we should be careful we don't jump to conclusions or assume we have the knowledge of things where we actually don't by trying to be uh, too clever. Gender issues. We're talking a lot about modernism, uh, of course, and, and the rural landscapes, and the role of 
different genders, the role of men and women in these agricultural schemes has always been quite an interesting one. Um, and often maybe there have been quite big differences between, let's say, in Portugal and Spain, with the domination of the Catholic Church and the traditional roles of, uh, of women versus perhaps the, uh, at least in the early phases of uh, socialism and communism, the liberation of women and, uh, and giving them uh, jobs and uh, things like this. So the role of women and the expectations of men and women are maybe quite different in some of these cases, but I don't think we've necessarily uh, talked uh, sufficiently. And then there's the domestic sphere. So I know some people are quite interested in the, uh, the housing and how was that from a point of view of the domestic sphere, raising families, uh, what was the, the, you know, you had indoor plumbing and maybe washing machines, I don't know, but you also had to do cooking and, uh, and, and all of that. And when you look at those posters um, and other features of the propaganda materials that we've seen, like there was the, uh, the, the magazine aimed at Ukrainian kolkhoz women, you know, and those pictures on those, that propaganda, it's usually a man and a woman exhorting people to join the kolkhoz or, or demonstrating the quality of the milk or the, uh, the butter or uh, inviting you to come and, uh, and see the products of the, uh, the agricultural cooperative or, or whatever. So how, what is the significance of that? And, the, and, the, and, and how family values were, were very important in some places and maybe less important in others. Um, the role of women in the, in the kibbutz movement in Israel was very, very interesting and uh, important. So there are many areas where that's a feature, but we haven't, I don't think so far, really brought it out. And, and it hasn't really perhaps been very visible in the, um, in the, in the, uh, the, the, the outputs. I'm about to cough, excuse me. <coughs> Maybe it would be a good idea if one of our students could, um, run, uh, yes, uh, run down and, and get me some water, please. Thank you. I'm talking too much, obviously. <laughs> um, then we had, uh, I think, quite a, a bit of interesting stuff from uh, Anastas Tostoych, for example, talking about the architecture and the architectural heritage. Um, and I think it's been kind of interesting in some of the projects that we've been looking at, the way in which we're talking about modern, the modern, capital M, modern, modernity in architecture, and how many of these projects really do have um, clearly very modern um, uh, uh, styles and so on, but also the vernacular, and how people were originally living in vernacular wooden houses, farmhouses in Estonia, or granite and schist houses in Portugal, or um, uh, brick and tile houses in uh, eastern Germany or um, whatever it might be. Um, and, and we saw the thing about the, uh, the Israeli, uh, the Israel in Palestine pavilion at the 1937 World Fair by uh, uh, Tzafir um, yesterday, where it was a kind of modernist form with, with a nod to Arabic forms and traditional um, Levantine forms and so on. So there seems to be something about this interplay of the purest modern, perhaps the Khrushchevka dumped in the village in Estonia is like pure modern, no nodding at all whatsoever to the vernacular, not in form, not in materials, not in construction techniques. Whereas in some of those Spanish or Portuguese, you've got forms of buildings that have touches or they have certain aspects of, of, of the vernacular. And there was quite a bit uh, talked about those surveys that architects have been very fondly doing of the vernacular and, and capturing uh, this as, as architectural history. And those same people were capturing those at the time that modernity was coming in and how that interplay is. So even though the focus is on modernized scape, modern, modernist landscapes, nevertheless, of course, they're all in places with a lot of the vernacular. And... Um, and, and the vernacular is frequently, of course, historically speaking, very um, um, appropriate for the genius loci, for the climate, the microclimate, for the, the, the ways of, of doing things pre-industrialization pre, uh, and so on. And there are lessons you can learn for energy efficiency and things like that from the vernacular, as well as lessons you can learn for how not to have uh, 
people living above pigs uh, uh, and and things like that. We saw that picture of uh, of people weren't having to live on top of the pig, asleep on top of the pigs. Uh, uh, in 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 uh, I think it was uh, the Azores or somewhere. Uh, and then something that was raised when we're talking about some of the mapping processes and, and where the land came from. Um, where was the land from this? Well, in Portugal, it was the commons. Um, in Estonia, the state just grabbed all the land and then distributed it to the, to the landowners, uh, first of all, and then um, forced them to be collectivized. There was private land, there was already state land that was then given out to these colonies in Spain, for example. There was land uh, bought by the Jewish National Fund uh, from Arabic uh, landowners in Palestine uh, before 1948 and so on. Uh, all of this is actually rather interesting, and particularly in the case of somewhere like Estonia, where the land was appropriated by the state and then given back to the landowners or many of the landowners afterwards. And so the whole thing has come full circle uh, in some places. Or else we've heard in uh, Portugal where... I think it was, where nobody really knows if they own the land or not. The, these former common lands, do they actually own it? Do they have a lease of it? What's their tenancy? What's their, you know, what's their situation? These are really interesting aspects which perhaps haven't yet been, uh, been looked at. Because when we do some of this mapping, we can then put cadastral maps on it. We can then start looking at the, uh, at the original owners and then the new owners um, and, and what's the current ownership and all of these, these kinds of things. So it maybe gives some ways of looking at uh, aspects to do with the people and the land, rather than just looking at it as a mapping exercise, for example. The sustainability of schemes. Well, many of them, as we know, uh, like uh, all the kolkhozes, for example, uh, went bankrupt or collapsed. Not necessarily, they wouldn't necessarily have done so if the Soviet system had kept going on, but because it didn't, and because the market, the internal market of the Soviet Union disappeared, uh, they had no way of, uh, of working in it because it wasn't a proper uh, market uh, economy. So they collapsed. But maybe they were actually quite viable towards the end. They seemed to get to the point where it was like, yes, now we know how to run a coal horse. Now we're getting profitable. Oh, it doesn't exist anymore. Hmm. Um, the struggles to succeed that went on to the end, some lasted longer than others. Were they socially sustainable? Um, or did people vote with their feet as soon as there was a revolution and, uh, and they could get away from that? But sustainability of the schemes, but then the sustainability of the continuing use of them. For example, in the Pontine Marshes, where we hear quite a lot about uh, the kiwi fruit production for the European market, uh, lots of uh, all that drainage of marshes, uh, the pesticides, the intensive methods, uh, land abandonment in some places and rewilding in others, which might be leading to more ecologically diverse and rich uh, places with, with greater um, uh, ecological sustainability. So economic sustainability, clearly uh, we, can, we can see how that was. Social sustainability, very interesting how, uh, how some places have been depopulated and other places have been uh, become uh, a target for, for migrants like the Sikh uh, population communities from India working in the in the Pontine Marshes, for example, and uh, all of these things, which um, may be uh, in interesting to consider in this um, comparative analysis of things. And we always have this this uh, aspect of the urban in rural, um, urban lifestyle in a rural setting, um, having having the toilet and having the kitchen and having the central heating and the electricity. I'm just thinking back to the 1920s when my grandparents got married um, and um, my grandfather, uh, and, and, and they'd lived in, the, in a village, okay, um, and had electricity and even had a vacuum cleaner and things like this. And then my grandfather said, right, we're going to go and live on the farm, which is only a mile away from the village. And my grandmother was saying, really? I have to go and live there. There's no electricity. What are we, going, going backwards in time. So anyway, she had uh, a girl to come and do all the cleaning and things like that. So she, she didn't have to do the hoovering with, with no hoover. But still, you know, it was like going backwards to the countryside. And that's this view, isn't it? The rural, as uh, Andres Koppel was talking about from, from Etag at the very beginning. The rural as the old-fashioned. The rural as to do with cows and hard work and... Uh, 
and poverty and all of these kinds of stuff, and the possibilities of, uh, of, the, of the urban in the rural, and the quality of life and so on. But nowadays, we have all this reverse. People want to live in the countryside. It's very big in Britain. There's a whole TV series called um, Escape to the Country, where the presenters go around with people who want to buy a house in the countryside. And uh, they're looking for this wonderful countryside lifestyle. And they don't realize it smells of, uh, of uh, slurry and uh, pigs noise and tractors blocking the roads and uh, you know all these kinds of things that have this, this idealized look of it. So we have people who, who view the countryside and the rural as, um, as the idyllic place to go to. Um, so we've got the reverse movement, not from the countryside to the city, but from the city to the countryside. And I think Gerhard was pointing that out. Even with blocks of flats, you're getting this sort of rural lifestyle, and you can then commute down the motorway and go and work uh, Luft for Lufthansa or in the big uh, financial sectors in, in uh, Frankfurt or, or what it is. Um, and then other aspects that bring the urban into the rural is the things like the industrialization of construction and all of those platinbau panel buildings and, uh, and all the rest of it that, uh, that came in as opposed to the vernacular and everything. So there are areas there which were raised as being ones which hadn't been maybe floated enough or talked about enough and which are uh, something to, 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 to consider. Um, so th there were some, I think, very interesting aspects about ideologies that were brought out, and uh, Catherine Maumi was talking about this, and we've, and we've seen, of course, at the time of a lot of this modernism was, okay, it was happening before the First World War, but it was post-First World War with all of the revolutions, with the new nations, with the, the Bolshevik Revolution, with the rise of fascism in Italy in the 1920s. All of these things, we started to have these... It was a very ideologically dense period, and somehow it's not very much so nowadays. Um, they all kind of uh, uh, died out, um, or whatever, um, as, as mainstream things. So maybe in 1968 was the, the sort of the last gasp of, of ideology in, in some ways. But what I think is interesting that people were bringing out is how there's so many similarities. Even though they are complete opposites in the political spectrum, when you look at the outputs, when you look at some of the approaches, when you look at some of the materials, the graphics, the films, the propaganda, you know, could you tell really of those posters which were communist and which were which were fascist. It's very difficult to tell in some respects. Um, so where does ideology go now? Is it neoliberal capitalism and the, the its effect on the modern um, rural of uh, 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 the kind of things that Dirk was just talking about uh, with the trade wars and all these kinds of things? Or is environmentalism the new uh, ideology uh, that uh, is, is uh, taking over or has taken over? and all the different things that are sort of generally speaking underneath that. So we can look at these ideologies as being more or less historical, but actually what took on from them and where has it led and where is modernism and contemporary moving forward after that? Which leads me to contemporary modernity. What char characterizes contemporary modernity in the rural landscape? Um, is it gentrification of the countryside? Uh, is it, as what they have in Ireland, uh, Bungalow Bliss? Um, that's a book by a, an architect which has about 100 model designs for bungalows. And everybody in Ireland who could got money and built a bungalow. So it's like suburb throughout the entire country, essentially. Other people call it bu Bungalow Blight. Um, and uh, so you get this gentrification and this like uh, uh, urbanization, again, of, of the rural in that way, an urban sprawl. Where does the rural and the urban stop and start? And that's been a big focus of, uh, of other projects and research. Uh, the peri-urban, the urban sprawl, uh, the gentrification, the, the, the urbanized values of people living in villages and things like this, not seen as a positive thing, but seen to some extent as a bit negative. And then other features that are coming in, like renewable energy infrastructure, huge wind farms, huge solar farms um, in many areas, the new crops, what you're farming from the landscape is the wind and the sun. It's not directly crops anymore. And all this anti-modernity, you know, the anti-capitalist movements, the back to the land movements, 
um, people wanting the good life. They want to go and live uh, in a sort of neo-hippie existence, raising their own chickens and, uh, and such like, and making felt things for craft markets and, and stuff like that. That's a, kind of one extreme. But the, the hobby farmers, the people who've got fed up with the city and uh, use their money to buy a farm and to raise special cheese or goats or, uh, or uh, make uh, organic wine. There's lots of things like that, which is a kind of contemporary, modern uh, way of moving things. So where our projects stop, they just, of course, continue on in, in time, don't they? Things like that. Reading propaganda. So this is a, perhaps a, an interesting area of how we can do this, and maybe um, we need some extra expertise. I'm not sure about how to do that through the images from posters, symbols, film, other forms of art. We see archetypal images, like I was just mentioning, and these seem to be kind of cutting across those different ideologies. So how to read this effectively uh, using uh, document analysis techniques, things like that. So that was all I really want to say. I'm sure you've listened to me quite enough. Uh, so we can open that now to uh, some reactions and some discussion. Um, I'm not putting it forward as, as a, I'm only really reporting to you back what you reported in the sessions. You know, this is, this is what I see as kind of generally proceeding from that. So this is not my personal opinions. These are the things that were observed by the chairs, fed to me, and I'm... I'm feeding it back. So I suppose we can say, does it kind of reflect um, quite a lot, you know, is it an accurate ref reflection of, um, of, uh, of, of what the conference has, has covered um, and, and some of the issues that are worth taking forward? So we'll go from there. I'd, I'd prefer if it was open more for a kind of uh, debate within the audience rather than, you know, uh, to and fro kind of thing. So I'd like to sort of back off a bit and let the, deba the, be the, the, uh, the debate develop and uh, be amongst everyone. <coughs> ah, yes. Uh, can we go back? Uh, I can't. Oh, yes, I can move it. There are, there are yes, okay. Good point. Yeah, it's just um, a remark. I'm I'm surprised not to see the word community in the keywords. That's just it. I think there was much talked about communities and community building and community feeling, and it does not show. And so it's mm -hmm. just... Uh, it's, it's possible because I don't think I had all the final papers. I'm not 100% sure if I had absolutely everything from the moderators. So it could be that one of those... That I'm not sure. But I know uh, I don't have quite all of them and they hadn't been all somehow got to me. So it could be that they're ones that appeared that I didn't pick up because they weren't in, in that. But if you get them all... No, it's just but you're quite right, actually. Yes, I agree. Yeah. It's just that I think it's something which has been pretty much talked about and we cannot see it in ideological or whatever mm -hmm. chapter. Fair enough, yeah. I, I would add two points, or three perhaps, just, yeah. Two. The first thing which surprises me a bit uh, throughout our project and uh, in what I've seen in the conference uh, is that I would have expected that since we're dealing with rural landscapes, uh, they would be a bit more focused uh, on the analysis of the physical landscape itself uh, at its pictural qualities, you know, the, the very conventional landscape analysis. Is it 
grid-like? Is it uh, mostly flat? Is it mostly mountainous? Is it mostly whatever? Uh, so one can uh, characterize uh, the pictorial qualities of a number of very well-known landscapes. Uh, but when one asks, what is a modernist rural landscape? Then you need to start making up a very complex argument, while perhaps there are a few easily understandable elements that might be singled out. I don't know why. Perhaps it has to do with our disciplinary ba background or with uh, the fact that there are no such evident physical features. So that's one first comment. Um, the second is perhaps a bit related to what Victor just said, um, but I had the feeling that uh, there was a bit of nice discussion about subversion and agency. Uh, we didn't comment on that, but in Safir's uh, uh, presentation, for instance, the architect Richard Kaufman, at a time when Palestine was under British control, he was very habile to present himself both in British organization, but then in the competing French organizations, uh, and to play with the other competing powers uh, 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 across there. Uh, we talked about passive resistance of the settlers. Uh, we talked about strikes. Um, Jean-Francois Lejeune, uh, in the first session, I know, talked about how one uh, Spanish architect actually uh, subverted the rules of the physical patterns of the, the, the Spanish pueblos uh, against the will of the funding body. So th there is at a certain point not only um, either a very coercive top-down will or and passive settlers or very... Um, uh, how do you say, volunteering and democratically strong settlers. They are in the middle of that tensions. And the last thing is, um, not sure it has been addressed, but I wonder if that's not a point to put on the research agenda. Uh, I wonder uh, to which extent the things we are looking at could and should be framed within economical cycles. Um, I mean, the fact that in certain countries, at certain periods, not all countries at the same time, there is the focus on autarky or the focus on uh, agricultural industrialization. There are uh, drifts back and forth, back to the land, back again to the city. Um, the fact that at a certain point after Second World War, a lot of talk on modernizing the rural escape, landscape has to do with a uh, private appropriation of the landscape for the sake of housing and tourism, uh, and that's yet another economy uh, popping in. So I, I wonder if that doesn't allow us uh, to frame a bit better the diversity of the case studies that we've been mentioning. Okay, good. And on that score, of course, it's not just the economical cycles, but it's the kind of, um, well, the wars, because we had two wars in the middle of that, and there were refugee crises, and uh, various civil wars and other wars that went on. So all of that, the political turmoil and the economic turmoil, which was often associated with that, like the Great Depression and these kinds of things that led to the rise of certain, certain things, all of that ec economically, political, um, phase of the 20th century is uh, is very specific, really. After the long peace of the 19th century, uh, apart from the Franco-Prussian War and the Austro-Prussia War, yeah, it's uh, always the Prussians. It was the Prussians, yeah. But there was the long peace after Napoleon, which allowed the Industrial Revolution to develop and all of these things to go ahead without a great big break and the Pax Britannica and things like this. And then the, the, we had these turmoils of the 20th century, which left all the empires in ruins and the national new nation states and all the new testing of things and everything else went in that way. And um, in some senses, we're seeing a bit of a repeat of some of those aspects with the rise of nationalism and refugee crises and uh, economic protectionism and stuff like that. Uh, so 
it's all part of those cycles too, isn't it, as well? Now, one might not want to perhaps to comment specifically on, on, on the things that Simon just uh, put out and just say how badly the conference was organized or uh, how unjust the reviewing of the papers were. Uh, that would be also a good feedback to get. We are actually going to organize a uh, survey which we'll send out asking about the conference and uh, aspects to do with that. So um, that will be coming. Are you wanting to comment on these things, Vittoria? I don't know if it's related of the, to these things or as a general comment. Um, we were discussing pretty much yesterday with Emily and Christoph um, about a way of representation, which is, I think, one, one big issue that we should start thinking about, we as modscapers. Um, if we think about how to represent, how to do the mapping, how to represent uh, the landscape, how can we uh, explain a landscape through photographs, through description? Is there any graphic can we use? <coughs> we were especially discussing about a way of representing interviews. Is there any other method that just transcribing and, and putting words to visualize it? And um, um, I think I'm starting, I will start collecting from, um, from examples some nice way to visualize. And I would be happy maybe if each of us could contribute to have a kind of a pool to, to develop some idea that maybe um, could help us uh, from a scientific way to, 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 to um, kind of transmit and, trans and, and, and how to say, um, give over the information uh, a little bit beyond the usual writing or maybe having a nice map. Maybe we can think about uh, other way of graphics and representation to, to explain what we want to do. Because um, we were very much interested in all this kind of interdisciplinarity. And so we should also think about new method of, uh, of explaining what we are finding out. I think we probably, yeah, I think we have some of those. Um, needing further elaboration and so on, but yeah. Any any more for any more? Going once? Okay, Luca. <laughs> it's voice activated, isn't it? Uh, <coughs> um, uh, please let the, the the slide of, of the of the of the list of oh, the again uh, right okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no because it's, it's interesting this this uh, this list of uh, questions and uh, probably is uh, is true that we can uh, intersect uh, different uh, point of view and uh, and uh, problems uh, around that in that intersect the, the different uh, uh, intervent that we had but uh, uh, we uh, assisted at the sort of uh, 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 probably sort of more simple and more beautiful thing so uh, it, it, we assisted a sort of a big fresco a big painting of uh, different stories and uh, uh, this is, is very mm, uh, Part uh, this is part of the European story, so it's, it's a deep uh, uh, history that uh, that uh, that is around uh, the different uh, study cases. So uh, probably is it mm, I, uh, uh, at least in my mind remind the the, the, the uh, mm, not remind but uh, uh, there is the, the the memory of that. Uh, study cases as a part of a big stories that has uh, in each context uh, specific uh, each possibilities and uh, techniques uh, techniques of mm, narratives and uh, so i think uh, this uh, uh, slide and this uh, is necessary to uh, explain uh, the, the the mechanical of this uh, of this uh, of this uh, 
days. But probably after this, there is a sort uh, something of deep, uh, of deep uh, the, that, in, that is in the particularly of the history. What you just said there th sprung into my mind that we want a sort of series of uh, Diego Rivero can, um, murals which encompass all of these things kind of in one powerful image as, as one output, a huge, in Brussels or something, a Diego Rivera <laughs> kind of thing. Yes, uh, somewhere, yeah. Hello, um, so um, I am not part of this uh, research project, but uh, what I'd noticed during my time as a, as a spectator here is that there is a lot of uh, knowledge coming uh, coming out. I mean, there is uh, we collected uh, a lot of uh, different histories, a lot of uh, different stories, not histories. I mean, a lot of different experiences. Uh, but every time at the end, I thought, uh, okay, but uh, what should we do with all this knowledge? <laughs> I mean, the problem is uh, that the people who uh, think is not the same as the people who act. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, so I think that the, uh, after we collected all these, uh, you know, different uh, point of view, the, the important thing would be to, uh, you know, spread it out uh, to publicize it. I don't know, uh, in order to make it. Uh, useful, useful for further uh, de development, uh, for, for action. Uh, 